All right. Today's Mimer is from uh, Tavshach of Zion, from 1967. It's a Mimer from Parshas And there's a crossover to Purim, actually. Interesting crossover to the Megillah. It bases itself on the end of the Parsha. At the end of the Parsha, we have the narrative or the story of the commandment of the small golden altar, known as Be'ach Akhtedus. So the Mimer starts off with Asisa Mizbe'ach. You should make an altar. Mikdark Tedes that you're going to bring incense upon. The Amru Razal. Our sages tell us this is both found in the Medrash and Vayikra Rabba, as well as in the Gemara in Yerushalmi, in the Talmud Yerushalmi, in Meseches Chagiga. So the Gemara says, Miskater Biktedes Ein Ksivkan. In Hebrew, the proper grammar should be Miskater, that an altar through which the incense is brought, but rather it says the incense that offers mikdar ketores an 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 a, a an, an altar that offers ketores. So the Gemara says, and the Medrash says, ha mizbeach hayamaktiras That is to say that the mizbeach, the altar itself, used to offer the incense. Vahainu. The Mizbech itself used to bring the incense without any assistance from the earthly fire, the terrestrial fire that was provided by the Kohanim. Elo be'esh shalmailo. This used to happen with a heavenly fire. So the Ketorot, according to the teachings of our sages, based on the precise analysis of the verbiage that the Torah selects, the ketorot was brought by heavenly fire. They went through the motions. They put a fire on the, on the altar. They, it seemed as if they were bringing it, but not, not really. Really, the mizbeach itself was sending the incense heavenward. Umitamze, and because of this, because the, the ketorot, because the incense was being consumed by a fire that was non-terrestrial, non-material, non-literal, a fire that was coming from a higher place, that this was the mizbeach itself was somehow being maktir was it was offering this incense or burning this incense because of this because of this there's a little technical problem or issue that develops with the with the mizbech and that is the mizbech is built of wood covered with gold so it's a very thin veneer it's like the the, the depth of a coin even a thick coin but it's still a coin so the, covered by the depth of a coin of gold, which is a soft metal. And if you heap a, a piece of wood, a wood structure, with a thin veneer of metal, if you heap it with coals, what should naturally happen? It should burn right through the veneer, and the wood should be burned. And we don't really have an answer for how that didn't happen, other than there was something miraculous at play. So here, the Gemara, the Gemara tells us, here's the answer. The answer is that the fire wasn't literal. It went through the motions as if it was little fire, but actually no, it was a heavenly fire. And that's why Tzipu Yamizbeach, that's why the veneer of the Mizbeach was not burnt. Why? Because fire can be destructive. In fact, that's what fire by definition is. It destroys the subatomic structure of reality. It pulls apart the electrons. It releases all the electrons. So the protons and neutrons collapse. And then whatever it was, the structure that was, simply collapses when you have fire because the release of that energy basically pulls apart the, 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 the quantum physics of, of what makes something exist. But that's when we talk about earthly fire, material fire. But heavenly fire is pure energy. It's not the energy that has to be extracted from the molecular subatomic structure. When we talk about heavenly fire, it's an energy that it doesn't have to be pulled from somewhere else. It's not, it doesn't have to destroy the nuclear physics in order to release the fire. We have many examples like this. The most famous one is probably the burning bush. Well, here was a bush that was totally on fire and yet not being consumed. Why? Because of Eishel Mila. It was a heavenly fire. It was a higher fire. It didn't follow the dictates or the parameters of fire as we know it, material terrestrial fire. Okay, the is of Medesh Rabbo. Like we learned in the Medrash elsewhere, and this is found actually in the Medrash in our parsha. Shoya Moshe Tomalzeh. Moshe was astonished. He said, "How is this going to work?" 
said, it's impossible that the coals will not consume the wood of the Mizbech. It can be. The veneer of gold, the, the, the gold plating, not electro plating, actual plating, but the actual plate of gold was like the depth of a gold dinner. How thick could a gold dinner be? It's a coin, a thick coin. Is, is no way it could be able to survive that kind of onslaught, that kind of heat. Hashem responds to Moshe Beinu, who wonders aloud, how could this be? And he says to him, Kach darki This is my way in the heavenly fire. The energy further consumes the energy. In other words, the energy nourishes itself. Usually the energy needs to be nourished. It needs, it needs fresh electrons. And the only way you can get those fresh electrons is if it pulls them out of somewhere else. What happens to the subatomic structure that was being held together by those electrons? It collapses. It collapses because it needs the electrons. And the nature of fire is that fire elicits fire. So whenever you put fire to something, the other thing will catch fire, presumably if it's flammable, meaning the electrons will be released and the subatomic structure will collapse. Did However, it heat? did the, this heavenly fire give up heat? I don't know. I would presume that it did. Because we have a story with the Kohen Gadol, they had to be very careful that the heat shouldn't hit him in the face. So, I, I would assume, yes, but, I, but I, I don't know. I wasn't there. So we, here's what we do now. It was not a normal or natural fire, and the normal, shall we say, normal limitations of nature would not apply over here. So by nature, the Mizbeach should have burned. The veneer should have melted. The wood should have been incinerated. Didn't happen here. Because it's all the Eish Milo. So the Rebbe says, This needs to be understood. So he introduced the principle to us, this, this teaching from our sages, beginning with a biblical exorcist, with multiple sources that say the same thing. The Mizbeach brought itself, or the incense brought itself on the Mizbeach. Or the, or the Mizbeach brought the incense. So the Rebbe says, Please explain to me, Mahu ha'iloi be'inyan eish shalmaila. What exactly is this virtue, virtue, this wondrous virtue that we have a heavenly fire that consumes the ketorah rather than an earthly fire? Shadafke hu, that specifically the heavenly fire, ha'yamaktira saktedus is bringing the ketedus. The hine. In yonim, so you're going to say, what do you mean? It's heavenly fire. It's, it's miraculous. It's gewaldic. No, one second. The hine. The concept of these two fires, these two distinctly different fires, which is what we call Eish Shalmata, the fire from below, and then Eish Shalmaila, the fire from on high, which is a euphemism because it's not if you climb in a ladder, you don't get closer to this fire. If you go into a spaceship or you go into outer space, it doesn't mean you're closer to God. God is as much in, 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 in the stratosphere as God is right here. In, in the ground. It's, 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 it doesn't mean, the, the idea of higher and lower, heavenly and earthly, is all euphemistic. It's, me, it's a metaphor. So this notion of the heavenly fire, meaning the spiritual fire, the higher, loftier existence of fire, and the lower form of fire, when we speak about the service of a, of, a, of a person, how a yid has to express himself to Hashem, so all of these fires are actually speaking about the neshama. That's what this fire really is about. This fire is about energy. And the energy speaks about the rhythm or energy of the soul, of the neshama. So the neshama can basically function in two ways. There can be isarusa de lasata, an awakening from below, where the neshama is stirred, and where its fire is provoked, and where the neshama begins to yearn like a fire that seems to be leaping off the wick, a fire that seems to be taking leave of its source of, of life and vitality, it seems to be going somewhere else, like it's explained in the writings of our sages, that it's going to Eish Shomayla, the fire is going to this higher or, or, or a loftier fire that's reaching for something higher, and that it's prepared actually to leave behind its, its source of sustenance. That's the nature of fire. So that's a metaphor for the neshama. Like we say that a, a neshama is is Neir Hashem Nishma Sadan, the lamp of God, is the, is the soul of man. So there was the soul of, of a person is this energy, this raw energy that yearns, that seeks to cleave and to become absorbed into something higher. So what's a Shalmata and a Shalmaila? A Shalmata means this is what the, the fire that the Neshama is able to generate on its own. The Neshama itself begins to yearn. The Neshama itself, and when the Neshama itself yearns, 
there's it, it, it takes collateral, so to speak. It, there's, there's, it, 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 it does something. If a person would direct his attention towards Hashem and engenders or creates within himself a desire to be close to Hashem, it will consume the bodily reality, the materialism. If that's where your love is, if that's what you want, so it'll incinerate, burn up, in a good way, by the way, but get, get rid of the negativity in life. If a person has a lot of negativity in life, what should he do? He should refocus his energy in a higher way. And the higher energy will consume the lower energy. It's like a fire consumes it. So the fiery nature of the neshama can consume all the toxic stuff in life. Like it says that if a person is drawn to things which are inappropriate, instead he should redirect himself towards Hashem. And what will happen? then the passions and the fire and the fervor that he exists for lower, for material things, will now be elevated. It'll, it'll consume that fire. A person who has passion is not a bad person. A person who has passion has potential. You have to harness that potential. You have to use that fire for something higher. So, Eishel Maila, in the terminology of Avedis Hashem, means Isarusa de Lasata, pardon me, Eishel Mata. And then there's Eishel Maila, then there's the heavenly fire. Heavenly fire is when you're really not tuned into the godly or divine spiritual reality. You're kind of caught up in your own things. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you suddenly have this yearning, blazing, burning desire to come close to Hashem. And you ask yourself, where did that come from? I wasn't, I wasn't making an effort or toil. I wasn't learning Hasidus. I wasn't immersing myself in davening. How did I suddenly get this fire from? Ah, oh, this fire. So every once in a while, Hashem knocks on the door. Hashem sends a fire. Now here's the thing with that fire. It burns with great intensity. But you know what? That fire can also burn itself out very quickly. And it doesn't necessarily engage the material reality that we live in. In other words, it, you won't necessarily catch on fire. So a person who has Isarusa de la a heavenly fire, it's Eish Eich la Eish. The energy consumes itself. But the energy does not necessarily pull the electrons out of the material metaphoric subatomic structure. It doesn't turn you into a holier, better person. Because you're only on fire for as long as you're being fired. But the moment you're no longer being fired up, well, the fire is gone. So he said, this is the Lestela'ela, it's wondrous. That's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rapturous fire. But it's a rapturous fire that doesn't affect internal change. It doesn't make us a different person. Whereas Isarus Lasata, because it's the byproduct, the awakening from below is engendered and resulted and created of our efforts, it does change us as people. We're different because we burn up with this fire, because we created this fire from in the inside. And that's Isarus Lasata. So this is, this is really the two levels of fire. So what's the question then? The question now is so obvious. Avaidis Hashem, service to God, is all about what? Us getting lucky. Us tripping into a higher reality by mistake, not even knowing how we got there. Is that what Avedi Hashem is about? That God sent us here for a mission. What was the purpose? To just be here like a, like, a, like a clueless monkey and all of a sudden, boom, you got this fire, you got this excitement and fervor and passion and it burned for a little while and then just went back to whatever you're doing. Is that the purpose? Or is the purpose that we should change ourselves, that we should work with ourselves, that we should overcome the minutia, the niggling details, the anxiety, the stupidity, the, the f folly of life, and redirect ourselves. We should serve Hashem. I think everybody around this table understands that it's all about us serving Hashem, not about Hashem utilizing us and we being clueless. So which fire does that? The lower fire or the higher fire? The lower fire. So why would the Ketorik be consumed by a higher fire? which in the metaphor or in, or in the parable translates into the idea of the neshama being fired from on high, when the whole idea is the neshama needs to be fired from below. If it's fired from on high, it doesn't do anything. It's nice, but you didn't get any credit. You didn't work at this. How did a, a president once say, you didn't build that. You didn't build that. It's not yours. If it's not yours, you didn't build it. What are you so proud of? And that's the question. So the Aveda, Sa'adam, has to come, Isarus to Lasata. And call Iker Inyan Hamigdash, Mishkan and Migdash. The whole idea of the Mishkan and Migdash is a Hamshacha, Shaba, it's an actualization of the godliness, which comes, Al Yadei, by the hands of, or virtue of, Avedas Ha'adam. Your efforts. It's all about our efforts. Dafka, specifically, emphasis on that. Kosov, like it says in the Pasuk that speaks about this whole idea of Asuli Migdash. God says, Make for me a Migdash. And what will I do when you make the Migdash? You do your part. 
Vishakanti Bisaikam, I will dwell amongst them. Why does God dwell amongst us? God made himself a Migdash? No, we made a Migdash. You make a Migdash, I'll dwell there. You build it, I'll come, said God. Not I'll build it and I'll come. And you just wonder what happened. You know those three people of that the world is comprised of three people, they said. The people who watch it happen, the people who make it happen, the people who wonder what happened. So Isrus Layla like could be the people who watch it happen. Or even worse, the people who wonder what happened. God's presence amongst us. Gee, I wonder where that came from. That's nice. Here today, gone tomorrow. Is that what it's about? Or is it about, we have to make it happen. So the Pasuk, the verse is very explicit. Va'asuli migdash. You make that migdash. Then you'll have v'shechanti b'seichem. I know in other words, shashra, hashchina, that the, the dwelling, the presence of God amongst us, right? V'shechanti. God said, I will cause my presence to dwell. I will make my presence manifest. Nas says it happens al yedei zeh or al yedei asiyas ha'adam dafka specifically through the efforts of humankind, what people do. Va'asu emphasis on va'asu. Va'asu means asiyas. Yeah, means doing, making, crafting, building. You do it. You did it. V'cheinu ba'avedes hakabana. So first of all, this is the whole Mishkan in general is a paradigm and, and it's the essence of you doing. That's how the, the scripture expresses it. You make it, I will dwell there. Now let's move on. What happens in the Migdash? We have the Aveda of offerings, Karbanot. And that's Aveda Ikris Be Migdash. That's a primary focus of the Besam Migdash. Hare in Yana, the whole essence of this Aveda is Aveda Shalomat Dafke. It's the Aveda that we have to do. It's about us performing the service, us making it happen. As the Friedrich Rebbe explains in the famous Maimarim of Basilagani, of Maimari Hilula, like it says, Reach Nichoyach, Opin Azal, our sages tell us in the Tayyidus Koyanim. And this is quoted by Rashi numerous times in his commentary in the Chumash. What is the essence of a Karban? If you want to understand the core organic essence of what makes a Karban tick, what makes it meaningful, it's very simple. Nachas Ruach Lafanai. God says, it, It's pleasing for me, it gives me Nachas. Why? What's so pleasing about this? Sha'omarti, I said, says God, and my will was done, carried out. In other words, Shahanachas Ruach, that the pleasure, the satisfaction. Shalomailah, whom is there, what does the Nachas Ruach come from? It comes from Shana said it that my bidding was done. So what makes a carbon a carbon? Doing. Nasa. You have to do it. If you didn't do it, you have no, you have no nachasurach. The nachasurach doesn't come from it happening. I don't know how that happened. No. It comes from you doing. You followed. I know this makes no sense to you, says God. I know you don't understand how anybody is going to be helped or assisted when a fine animal that could have fed many poor people whose leather could have been used to make tefillin and mezuzah and sifrei Torah and now you just burned it up. It's always left as ashes. What's the point? And I'm feeding God lunch. It makes no sense. Eh, I know what God says. That's fine. But I asked you to do it, didn't I? Yeah. And you did it. Even though it didn't make sense to you. Beautiful. That's my nachas. My nachas is when you do. Like we say in the Haftorah of the Shabbos, toiv shmoyam is ever toiv. It's not about the offering. It's about obedience. God wants obedience from us. You do what I said. So if God wants us to do what he said, what's the essence here? What's the emphasis on? Doing. <laughs> we have a funny miser. A story over here with Katerus that brings itself. If the Katerus brings itself, for heaven's sake, it misses the whole point. It may explain why the Mizbeach didn't burn, but it doesn't explain the whole lesson of Katerus. It flies in the face of the whole thesis, the whole theory, the whole ideal of what Mishkan, Migdash, Korban, Katerus, of what all this represents. In Cain, any movement, it's not understood. Ma'ahu ha'ili, what's the virtue here? The Mikta Katerus. Shehu inyanei shalomayim. Well, in you know, the thing is like this. The Isa B'Zayar, it says in the Zayar in Chele Gimel, the following. Menorah, the menorah, right? The candelabra in the base of Mikdash. Sheva Butzinin Dilei. That the seven lamps of the menorah, the menorah has seven lamps, six branches and a central shaft. Each one is topped with a lamp, which is made of the very same block of gold, if it's made of gold. And those seven lamps... Hu'inyan, they are the metaphorical, spiritual idea which is articulated in terminology that's found in Megillus Esther. What does it say in Megillus Esther? 
Megillus Esther, it says, Sheva Hanaores Horauyes Lossus Lomi Besa Melech. So Esther was inducted into the palace, and she was not very happy about this. And Esther was given seven maidens, seven attendants. We learned this last night in the Gemara. Seven, ma- seven maids, seven attendants. On a literal level, the way the Gemara explains it, Esther was able to tell time and was able to keep Shabbos by virtue of the fact that she arranged these seven, these seven maidens to come at a certain time, like we, like we learned in detail yesterday, right? The Shabbos one would arrive just at sundown on Shabbos, and then the Shabbos one didn't know what the Friday one did, and the Friday one didn't know what the Tuesday one did. So Esther was able to keep Shabbos, and that's how she got through. That's on a literal level. But everything in the Torah, in the scripture, speaks to us on multiple levels. So there's the literal level, there's the way the story reads itself, and then there's the higher and more mystical, lofty spiritual levels, and there's layers upon layers upon layers. And when we read the Megillah, it's like the furthest gap, because the story is so crass, it's so ordinary, and, and actually, it all alludes to the highest spiritual truths. And when you read the Zohar, it's pure spiritual truths. We don't hear about anything literal. We're not, we're reading, we're reading seven maidens, we're reading about seven menorah lamps. And the Zohar says, Mitamon, the Eilech, from there onward, Viosisa Mizbeach Mikdak Teres. So we have the seven young maidens that is fit to be given to her. And from there onward, then comes the Mizbeach. Now, of course, you read the Zohar straightforwardly, you're like, what is going on over here? This makes absolutely no sense. That's fine, you have to understand it. So the Rebbe explains and, and very like, straightforwardly, simply, that the seven Neiris, they represent Sheva the seven young maidens. That, says the Rebbe, is Bechinas Isarusa Dileela Shenim Shaches Ayadei Isarusa Dilesata. That's an awakening from on high, which is engendered through an awakening from below. So we have this idea that the Neshama reaches out to God. When the Shem reaches out to God, God responds in turn, in kind. So that's called Isarus de la awakening from below, that elicits an Isarus de la So the Sheva Hanaores, the seven maidens in the spiritual metaphor, Hara'uyes la Sala, which is fit for her, meaning is earned, which she deserved, meaning the Neshama. Where does the Neshama get these seven maidens from, which represent the spiritual achievement from Beis HaMelech? from the king's house. Who's HaMelech? HaMelech is God. So in other words, you read, you read these verses that there are seven maidens that was fit to be hers. What does it mean fit to be hers? She earned it. She did something to get it. The Neshama did something. The Neshama earned these things. She'af she'im boyes be beis HaMelech even though they come from the king's house. So if it comes from the king's house, it's a gift from the king. Nonetheless, which is a serus de la'ila in spiritual terminology represents an awakening from on high. God gave it to us. The king gave it to us. Nonetheless, it's, it's, she, it's fit to be hers. If it's fit to be hers, that means she must have done something to uh, 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 earn it. It's rightfully hers. When if something is rightfully yours, it's not by accident. It's a, how, did I, how is that rightfully mine? I, well, I won it fair and square in a lottery. Well, whatever. Okay. But that's, somebody wants to say, rightfully mine? I earned it. I made an effort. I toiled. I worked hard. It's rightfully mine. So you say, these sheva na'ores are uyes, these seven maidens and what they represent are uyes lasasla. It's rightfully hers. It belongs to the shama. Why would it belong to the shama? Because she earned it. That means the yasurusa del the awakening from on high, which is earned, meaning engendered, created by the yasurusa del sata. We reach out to God, and because we reached out to God, God in turn responds and reaches out to us. But the golden altar, that comes entirely from on high. Why? There is a certain level where no amount of our effort will ever be able to elicit a response. This is so deep, this is so profound, that it's beyond what we can accomplish. So this is what we can do, and we should do what we can do. And then there's a level of divinity which no effort on our behalf is going to engender or bring about this response. This comes only from on high. For Inyan, who the thing is, the Hine Bezam is Bechais to two altars. Mizbeach Achitz in the outer altar. Mizbeach Hapnim in the inner altar, but the one we're talking about now, Inyan and Bavedas Adam, this represents in the Aved, in the service of a Yid, Chitzayin Yisalev, Upnim Yisalev. The outer rhythm, or the outer orbit of one's heart, or the inner essence, the quiddity of a heart. 
like we say in our daily davening. Hashem should enable our hearts to be at one with God. It says, it says, pardon me, Bezin, with two bases. It doesn't say, it says, it means there's two hearts. That we have to, so to speak, unify both hearts, the chitzonius halev and the panemius halev, the outer orbit of the heart, the outer exter- external, external realm or rhythm of the heart, and the inner rhythm of the heart. The ikir vishleimus aveda. When does a person reach the aveda? When does a person reach perfection in his or her efforts to serve Hashem? That's when you reach mitzad bechinus panemius halev. Not only you're superficially engaged in the aveda, not only on the surface you're happy about this and it means something to you but it becomes part of the fabric of your very soul it becomes your defining hallmark it is who you are and that comes that you should be totally transformed that it shouldn't be you going through motion it shouldn't be you engaging in things but rather that it becomes you that has to come from a higher place because DNA reassignment can't come from below. DNA reassignment or re- reorganization has to come from a higher place that comes from our Kaddish Baruch that's a Sarusud La'ila the whole essence, the purpose of our Aveda is it's to affect the union, so to speak, of the heavenly realms and the lower realms. That's why before every mitzvah we say l'shem yichud. We're trying to unite the level called kuchabrichu with the level called shinte, the level called the Holy One Blessed, he with the level called the manifest shechina, the manifest presence of God. Where is this yichud affected most perfectly? Where is this oneness? Where is this communion achieved in the most extraordinary, in the most wondrous fashion, most rapturous fashion? The answer is, Pnimius Halev, the inner heart. If your heart can change, if you can be a different person, if you can be motivated by davening that chocolate cake, if you can become excited about holiness, about doing somebody a favor, rather than about self-aggrandizement or profit, if that can make and really light your fire and excite you, then that comes, that means that that's like we learned in Hayom Yom yesterday. It's a wondrous gift when a Yid has a delight in doing somebody else a favor because that's counterintuitive. Intuitive is, I care about myself. Transcending self means I'll worry about somebody else. But what if about worrying about somebody else could actually become self? What if I actually delight in somebody else's success and I'm, I'm happy about somebody else's achievement and doing somebody a favor is not a burden or a pain in the neck but a wondrous opportunity, a gift. So that means you have changed. And that is the ultimate purpose and goal. So what, is it, what has the Rebbe said here in this Maimur? By the way, this Maimur goes on. We're not going to have time to, to move on. But this is just the first two chap- chapters of the Maimur. What's the point here? The question was that this form of Aveda, this form of service called the fiery love of Hashem that's achieved through the Mizbeach Azov seems to be happening by itself. If it's happening by itself, it's pointless. The whole other thing is we're supposed to do it. What's the answer to the Maimur? The answer is, when we do what we're able to do, when we exhaust our possibilities, then Hashem in turn responds to us. And that's what's going on here. So we do our part, which is the Aveda of the Mishkan. And when you do all the Aveda, all the offerings, everything as best as you can, then you reach the pinnacle, the climax, the apogee of serving Hashem, which is the Ketoros. And the Ketoros, if you will, brings itself. It's a heavenly fire. But ultimately, that heavenly fire is engendered through the earthly fire that we brought because we reached out to God with a fire because our neshamas were burning up an intensity in desire for Hashem. Ultimately, we were lit by a higher fire. And when we have that higher fire, then creation has reached its zenith, its perfection, its fruition in, in, in the world at large. And specifically, within our own soul, our own soul become transformed. And we are able to serve Hashem and come uni- united and connected, bonded, and one with HaKadosh Baruch Hu through the Keteris. It doesn't, we don't, not going to get it about here, but incidentally, Chesidus talks about the idea that the word Keter with a Tes in Aramaic means not. So Keteris is the Aveda of being come knotted. Like it says, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai said in the last hour of his life, Bechad Katiri is Katarna. I became knotted unto God. I became one with God. So the whole idea ultimately is becoming one with God, transcending creation, transcending independent existence, transcending me as separate from God, and reaching a level, we are perfectly, seamlessly, wholly consumed and absorbed into godliness. And how does that happen? Not by itself. You just said it happens by itself. Yeah. It happens by itself after you do a lot of work, try really hard, 
exhaust your possibilities like the 49th and 50th gate. You do everything you could and then the Ketoros, or so to speak, your holy, the holy fire, the holy nature takes over. Anyway, we have to leave it here. I wish all of our listeners Shabbat Shalom, good Shabbos. Hashem should help us. We should merit to achieve this even in some small, tiny way to light ourselves on fire, so to speak, to get our Hashem is going, not just with our earthly fire, but with a heavenly fire. And then we'll be Zeicha, hopefully, we'll merit very speedily in our time to see the Ketoros, the Menorah, and all the wonderful things in the third base of Migdash, Memheira, Ubi Amen, Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Amen.